Welcome to Conscious TV with Tom and Ramon. Uh, before we introduce our guest, we have a very special guest. But I just want to mention a few things. Um, don't forget that me and Tom are blue collar workers. And if you can, please donate. We don't charge for our archive for those of you who can't a are unable to help us. Um, you pay it forward for those of you who can. And also, today is the last day for the contest for Crystal Clark's uh, book, Who Are We Really 101, Return of the Shaman. Um, yeah, just and, pop over to the forums and uh, register on the forums, and that automatically enters you there. So, Yeah. And don't forget to check out our videos. We have a bunch of videos. Anything we find that's important, we have on. And what else, Tom? Uh, well, that's about it. New Paradigm page. Uh, we've got a lot of good things going on there. Uh, the seeds and the water and all that sort of thing. So check that stuff out. There's some good information there. Uh, 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 let's not forget to say hello to the 54th country, uh, Nigeria. Thank you for listening. Yes, absolutely. So who do we have, Tom? Do do our thoughts create our reality? Can we prove that consciousness survives the body's death? Is our entire universe just a hologram? After near-death experience in 1998, that set off an incredible series of paranormal events. Hazel Courtney felt compelled to seek out spiritual masters and leading scientists to help her uncover what was really going on. In this book, uh, Countdown to Co Coherence, uh, she has done an absolutely fantastic job of... Uh, bringing some coherence to uh, the thought process for those of us who are actually seeking and asking those questions. What is really going on? Hazel, welcome to Conscious TV. Well, that's a very, very lovely introduction, and welcome to you guys, and well done on doing what you're doing. So, Hazel, uh, would you explain to me, uh, actually, what, what was that event that happened in 1998 for our listeners? Right. Okay. What happened to me was I was a very busy weekly columnist with the uh, broadsheet, the Sunday Times newspaper in London. And I used to answer alternative health questions uh, to the public. It was an incredibly popular column way back then. And then uh, just before Easter of 1998, uh, it's very synchronicitous. We're doing this, you know, around the Easter period. Um, I walked into Harrods, which is a very famous department store in London, and I, as I went through the turnstile that used to be in the bread hall, um, in those few seconds, the turnstile stuck, and it wouldn't go forward, and it wouldn't go back, and it was as if this incredible release of energy came up through my body, and I had massive pain in my chest. Um, and in my head, and within about three or four seconds, um, I could hear a voice shouting in my head that I absolutely knew had not emanated from me, Hazel. Um, and obviously it was shouting, see a doctor now, uh, which sounded like a lot of common sense, considering I thought I was having a heart attack. So anyway, they managed to get me to my doctor's surgery within about 15 minutes, and whilst I was busy crying and they laid me on the floor and they stuck the heart monitors on me um, and I was busy giving them farewell messages for my husband and my daughter because um, anyone out there who's been through a near-death experience will know that in those final moments all you can think about is the people that you really love because it's at the end of the day it's all that counts. And anyway, so as he was playing my heartbeat down the phone to the cardiologist, I suddenly realized that I was able to feel what the doctor was thinking in my head. I'd like become somewhat telepathic. And so when I told my doctor what he was thinking and what the cardiologist was saying to him, um, I'm really not quite sure who was more shocked, whether it was him or me. Anyway, of course, I already knew that my heart was fine. Um, and so once I sort of got over all the panic and the shock, the doctor suggested that he couldn't figure out what was going on, but he sent me home and he said, I'll call your husband and, you know, he'll come and see what's going on. So he said, you better go home and go to bed and have a cup of tea, which in England is like our answer to absolutely everything. <laughs> and, and so I went home and, 
as I lay on the bed, I thought, well, I better ring a girlfriend and just share with her what just happened. And as I went to put my hand out to use the telephone, it sort of my my arm started doing its own thing and put the phone back in the cradle. And I realized with absolute incredulity that I wasn't being allowed <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me, um, to use the phone. And so I thought, OK, I'll go and wash my face or something. So as I looked in my bathroom mirror, my eyes were a completely different color. And considering the huge shock I'd just been through, um, I looked a lot younger. Um, my husband came home. Obviously, he was very concerned. He sat opposite me in the bedroom. I'll never forget. And he said, what on earth's the matter? And so, oh, this is when it got really interesting. I said to him, I said, oh, I'm, I've become very special. And so my husband's eyes widened and he said, what do you mean special? And I said, well, I said, I'm going to be able to do things like Yuri Geller. I'm going to be able to do some really weird things. And like, obviously, he was freaking out. And, and to be honest, so was I a little bit. My brain was cooking. It was as if I'd been plugged into an ultimate supercomputer. And when I asked questions in my mind, I got dozens of, of answers, but because I didn't know which one was right. And then the next day, um, I hardly slept at all because the energy was so enormous. Um, and the next day, I kept asking people to look into my eyes and they'd know who I was. And my eyes were like two enormous saucers. Um, but of course, I didn't know then who the ultimate I is, was, if you know what I mean. And then I developed an enormous, an incredible fever to the point they, would, they thought I was going to start fitting. Um, and I also was so cold, I thought I would freeze to death. Um, and then I realized that I wasn't being allowed to eat physical food. And believe me, guys, I like food. Uh -huh. And somehow I managed to get myself back up to the Midlands, a town called Birmingham, where we used to live. Um, and I took to my bed because I started levitating. I was losing weight very quickly. I had the fever going on. I had the voices in my head. Um, I mean, it was just the energies pulsing through my eyes. I was able to feel people's thoughts. I knew instantly what people around me were thinking. Um, uh, the weather was freaky, like there was this massive s snowstorm that shut eventually on the Easter Saturday all the train stations. Um, there was thunder, lightning, and somehow I knew that I was linked to the storm. Anyway, um, eventually... On the Easter Saturday, a friend of mine who was a doctor came up from London. He was a medical doctor because I knew I couldn't call my normal orthodox doctor. I knew that whatever was going on was not totally normal. And my next door neighbor in those days was quite spiritual. And she said, I think you've had a walk in. And I said, well, what the devil's a walk in? And she said, I think you're possessed. And I said, for God's sake, it's 1998. This does not happen to a Sunday <laughs> Times journalist, you know, not in the middle of Paris. So anyway, um, by this time, I was looking pretty poorly. You know, I mean, I got the voices shouting in my head. I was affecting electrical equipment. Uh, I was being affected by electrical equipment. I was totally telepathic, psychic. I was giving... Uh, like Darshan into people's eyes, not knowing what I was doing. And in the end, uh, with the doctor present, I, I kind of almost died of shock. I moved from this world to another, and I found myself on the ceiling of our bedroom looking down on myself. And it took me a while to <laughs> kind of realize that I, Hazel, were still alive but then it took me it was like watching a, a movie below me and I realized that this thing in the bed that looked so awful was me <laughs> um, and obviously I came back otherwise I wouldn't be here now and I did a, a sort of deal with spirit they said to me you can go back if you will tell the story if you will tell the truth of this story and what you're going to discover and so of course I did come back and I went on to write a book called Divine Intervention, which was the story of the walk-in and who I was walked in by and what happened to me. And that came out in about 2000, and it's just been reissued in the States last week. Um, and then, of course, it took me about six months to sort this whole thing out. I had to leave my column, 
which broke my heart. But when you are cooking electrical equipment, when you are shattering light bulbs, when you are telepathic, I mean, I mean you cannot. You just cannot live a normal life. You just can't. Um, anyway, uh, many things happened to me. But then after about six to nine months, I thought I have to find logical explanations for what has gone on. And I went on to start researching and I started to find people like William Tiller, who's a great physicist, and people like Professor Frederick Travis in Iowa, who have found what is the difference between a truly enlightened man or woman and the rest of us. And I, a whole load of stuff. And that went into the second book, um, which was called The Evidence for the Sixth Sense, which is also, I'm thrilled to say, being launched in the States. And at that time, I also met a guy called Professor Gary Schwartz, who you should definitely get on your show, um, who has spent many years researching survival of consciousness after physical death. And one of the first things I did was I contacted Gary, who thought I had completely lost the plot when he heard who I believed, who I thought my walk-in had been. In fact, I know who my walk-in had been. And I asked him to test me scientifically um, in Arizona. And after reading my story, he agreed to do that. And in fact, the results of those trials were so jaw-dropping, and I say that in his words, not mine, that he went on to write um, two forwards for those two books. And so then... Um, if if you want me to stop, do say so. I do tend to get verbal diarrhea, no, guys. Don't, don't go on. This is and then, so. uh, Okay. And then what happened after that was I went back to my life as a health writer and I wrote another big health book. Um, and then I kind of got the feeling again. You know how when spirit want you to do something, they kind of have ways of letting you really know about it. Absolutely. And more like a kick I, in the butt. <laughs> oh, and then some, and then some. I got more than a kick in the butt. Um, I had a major spiritual emergency, which is when spiritual awakening becomes a physical crisis, and uh, I don't recommend it to anyone. Um, but anyway, we can talk about that more later. But then I... Um, I thought, well, I really should perhaps end this trilogy and somehow bring the whole thing to a really fantastic conclusion. And But I thought, well, what am I going to write about? You know, like, is it going to be irritable bowel or what? You know, I didn't have anything more fascinating to tell people about. And so I said to Spirit, look, if you want me to write this third book, can you, like, set me on the right path? Now, this will freak you out. So what happened was like you with your radio station about a week later I have a, a back problem um, and so a week later I booked a massage in a place I hardly ever go I hadn't been there for years I booked the appointment in my married name at the last minute and when I turned up this girl did my massage and when I looked into her eyes I knew that she was like cooking with gas I knew she was online um, and I said to her, what's your name? And I didn't mean like our physical names, like Hazel or Wendy or whatever it was. And she said to me, she said, my name is Divine Intervention. Well, that kind of blew me away be <laughs> because that was the title of my story. And so I thought, whoa, you know. Um, and she said, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to read a book called The Disappearance of the Universe that was written, that has been written by a guy called Gary Renard. And so I thought, okay, all right, I'll read this book. And then the next day, my old secretary sends me an email saying, Hazel, would you like to go to this really interesting talk on Saturday? There's this guy coming from America. And she and I said, what's his name? She says, Gary Renard. Wow. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you start listening. Can don't you ask you for a little more clear? <laughs> so anyway, so I went to the talk. He had no time to talk to me, but he was basically saying that this entire reality is a hologram that if we could all place our ego into service for the whole without thinking what's in it for me. Um, he was saying a whole bunch of stuff, and it was kind of, it was new to me in that moment. Um, and so I said to him, I said, look, I, I you know, because so many people were pushing to speak to him at the end of this talk, and um, he said, look, if you really, really are serious 
wanting to interview me, you're going to have to get on a plane and come to Stockholm. I thought, well, they never make it easy, do they? So I went to Stockholm, and he's the first couple of chapters of the book, and that kind of set the tone of the whole thing. And so then I thought, I'll go to Arizona and speak again to Bill Tiller, because Bill Tiller had helped me a lot um, with how our thoughts create our reality. And when I got to Arizona, this is a couple of years ago, um, I said to Bill, I said, what is God to you? And he blew me away. He said, he said everything in the beginning. He said all levels of reality, all energy was coherent. And he said that in, in science, they call it being in phase. And he said to me, every now and again, this pure coherence decoheres. And so he drew me this little diagram, and he said it would have f formed non-physical societies, highly coherent societies, um, such as Mu. And then it said it would have gone on decohering, and it would have formed societies such as Lemuria. And then when it, when it would have decohered even more, it would have formed societies such as Atlantis. He didn't say they were those societies. He said they would have been like those societies, but they would have been non-physical. And I said, well, how did we come into being? He said, then such people, such uh, beings of light would then, he said, these people were very coherent. And he said that they would have literally intended this reality, this physical reality into being. Now, for any of your listeners who think that sounds so ridiculous, it's not true, you need to keep in mind that even theoretical physicist Michio Kaku, who works at New York University, says that to form a universe such as ours would take a very small amount of matter, as little as a net ounce because you have to keep people need to keep in mind that when the big bang happened which wasn't really very big at all yes it was a huge energy release but if we could have all been around at the moment of the big bang it was less than the size of an atom and you can get a million atoms behind a human hair so if we had been around half a second after the big bang you could have held this universe in your hand so when our space-time reality was birthed in that moment and time as we know it began, um, all energy that ever was or will be was released. So what we are is recycled energy and information. But anyway, going back to Bill, he said, so I said, okay, well, this decohering has gone on. So I said, you know, and we're here now. So I said, if your story is true, what happens next? And he said, ah, he said, well, according to my theory, he said, we've, humanity has reached a point of mir, uh, minimal coherence. So I said, well, where are we headed now, Bill? And he said, oh, he said, this is the good news. He said, consciousness is now on its way home, back towards coherence, which, of course, gave me the title of the book, Countdown to Coherence. Right. And I just, before I stop blathering on, um, it's really important that people should understand that along my journey, I had that word coherence came up so many times because Professor Frederick Travis, who's been studying the science of enlightenment for 40 years at the Center for Cognition and Consciousness in Iowa, had told me that what separates a truly enlightened man or woman from the rest of us is the fact that their brains act as one. In other words, it's coherent brain functioning. That means that the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain and the whole brain is, you know, the brain waves, you can see them really clearly rising and falling as one. And so when I was in that very, very highly coherent state way back in 1998, I, I really understood the phrase, I and my mother, father, God became as one, because there are no words to explain how blissful that feels. Right. I, I, really, I have, go ahead, Tom. I really like the way you, uh, you uh, expressed the uh, psychic connection that you felt 
that you knew what they, you, you could feel what they were thinking. Uh, that, that's an excellent way to, dis, to, to describe that connection. Uh, because well, 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 it makes me realize that when you are in the presence of a truly enlightened man or woman who's most probably spent lifetimes or decades in this time, lifetime, mastering their physical bodies, their emotional bodies, and so on and so forth, which, of course, I hadn't done. It happens spontaneously. So to integrate this kind of knowledge um, into your everyday life and to have the wisdom to use it wisely, whoa, that's a whole other story. Right. But the point is that when I was sitting with people, I knew, I felt what they were thinking even before they thought it. But what came out of their mouths and what they were thinking were always two entirely opposing thoughts. And so it made me realize that, can you imagine, guys, if we were all fully coherent, if we were all fully awake, or even more awake than, you know, I mean, 99% of the world's population don't have the faintest idea what we're talking about. But by teaching people to become more coherent, which we can do later on, um, then imagine if your intuition is so turned on that you automatically know whether someone's telling you the truth or not. Um, think how many lies could be just, I mean, just think how different life would be and, and, and the need for all this ridiculous ego posturing in the Middle East and many other places in politics and life around the world. Um, you know, we are all, we are all, I realize that what I went through if people could do it in a safe and controlled way, I'm very lucky to be alive. But I also realized and have heard from hundreds and hundreds of people who have spent a lot of their lives in psychiatric units uh, because they went through these awakenings and nobody knew how to cope with it. They weren't mad at all. They were walking between realities, between worlds, as I once did for a time. Right. I um I have to say that when you write about um your book is so well written and it's so such an easy read and it draws you in so easily and I really feel like I'm sitting down next to you to you and, and your guests while you're interviewing them. And I wish I wish it, I could come and kiss your feet for saying that, Ramon. <laughs> Because you don't want to kiss my feet. <laughs> Sorry, just, just the chapter with Bill Tiller, after I spent three days with Bill in Arizona, his two chapters took me more than three months to write because it, Bill was so upset that I had to, if you like, dumb down his amazing science because I, have to, I had to keep saying to these guys, speak to me as if I'm seven years old because I said if I can get it, Anyone can get it. And they were so upset, like Bill was so upset that his highly technical science had to be, you know, transformed down into a um, knowledge that anyone could get. And, and that's been my final goal. But it's taken me three years to do it. It, it, it doesn't read like it. Um, I, I'm sure you went through trouble uh, uh, writing it. But it. It, the main thing with with the book is, you know, we, me and Tom, we do a lot of reading. We interview a lot of different people, and we watch a lot of YouTubes. And the number one thing that the book hit me the most is every time I read your book, my crown chakra would just go crazy, and I felt like I was in a meditation. Wow! So towards the end of the book, when you're talking about um, the coherence of the book, and it was eight, what was it, eight seventy eight? Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I'll have you explain what that means, but it, I really believe that because it's such a high energy. And even even now, as as I'm we're talking to you, I can tell that everything that's coming out, it's one hundred percent truth. Because so, just the energy feeling behind it, and you guys have really have to pick up this book. So I mean, Ramon mentioned the the uh, the eight seventy uh, rating. Through and that's through kinesiology. Uh, would you explain that a little bit, please? Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, obviously, I'm trying to help people as much as I can for them to become more coherent at every level of their life, which will help them to be in the right place at the right time, be healthier, and basically awaken their inherent gut instinct. Um, but anyway, um, 
what it is, there's a guy called Dr. David Hawkins. He's written the most beautiful book called Power Versus Force. And I think his other book was something like The Eye of the Eye. But anyway, I recommend that everyone should pick those books up too. Um, anyway, David Hawkins has spent a lifetime, really. He's a fully enlightened person. Um, he was a psychiatrist. And uh, he also went through an intense spiritual emergency and came out the other side, but he's managed to retain it and integrate it. And he and many of his scientific colleagues started to calibrate through um, kinesiology, which is a form of muscle testing. So in other words, the, the concept is that, that your higher self, your soul self, uh, the divine part of you, um, always knows what substances or what foods uh, will suit you or not um, and you can test for pretty much anything and they started to calibrate levels of coherence from one to a thousand so their idea was that let's say the most enlightened person on the planet would be say someone like Jesus or someone like him who would calibrate at a thousand and then fear calibrates at a hundred and um, unconditional love, 500, and so on. Um, and guilt and uh, judgment calibrated at like 50. So what they're saying is, um, it's all right, I've lost the plot a bit here. Uh, basically what they're saying is that if you have a, a true master of the self and they calibrate at 1,000, they can transmute all of the negative energy produced by humanity because thoughts are things which helps keep us from destroying ourselves. And they also said that um, at the moment humanity calibrates at about 208 and that in any one lifetime, unless somebody wakes up to all this stuff, they can usually only grow five points in one lifetime. So I thought, crikey, that's not very much when I read it. And so he says that if you place your ego into service of the whole, just as Gary Bernard and many others did, and if you are willing to say to the universe, you know, how can I help rather than what's in it for me, then he said you can grow far more quickly. Um, and generally, he calibrated a lot of spiritual and religious teachings like way down, like a lot of the fundamentalist teachings now, he's got calibrated down at 250. Um, so it shows how incoherent we or how much we've decohered which is exactly what bill was saying and so through um kinesiology there are actually methods of measuring how coherent your brain is right now and the other thing i'd love to touch on is um, for instance fred travis told me that as you meditate and tune into the space between your thoughts, it's known as the vacuum level of reality, which we could perhaps come back to later. Um, he said, what happens is over time, your kundalini starts to wake up very slowly, whereas mine woke up in two seconds in Harrods. Um, <clears throat> and he said, when this happens, an area in the center of the brain, which is known as the thalamus, not the thymus, the thalamus, um, which is linked to sight, smell, touch. In other words, the senses. Um, it begins to switch on and it, it ramps up more. And so what happened to me that moment in Harrods, my thalamus woke up like into overdrive. And so I could smell more. I could see more frequencies. I could hear more frequencies. And suddenly I really began to understand. And so what Fred is saying that if people say can chant, because sound also helps the brain become more coherent, um, then this um, new reality can unfold more safely and over time. And then as you begin to discern what is your own ego speaking to you or like eat that extra chocolate cake, Hazel, against you know, don't eat it, it'll raise your cholesterol. You, In the end, you, you come to know when spirit are trying to get through to you. And this is really important because I ended up in New York on 9-11. Um, I was and, there as well. Oh, God. Were you really? Yeah, and, I'm from New York originally. Well, and you so know, when I, you were saying that, I, was, I understood 100%. 
Sure, your feelings. but I mean, I I had uh, three days before I left for New York, I had fallen over really badly and sprained my ankle. I was on crutches. Then I got locked in my hotel room before I went to the airport. I couldn't get out of the hotel room. Then after I checked in on my crutches and using a wheelchair, uh, the plane doors were closed without me getting on. But I was so determined to go to that meeting in New York, which had been to see Oprah Winfrey's people, which, of course, never took place. I was I just wasn't listening. So in other words, all the signals were there, but my ego had overridden it and my free will had overridden it. But in other words, if I'd been in a better space, I would have listened to the signals and thought, gee, you know, someone's telling me not to do this. Right. And so, you know, people the world over, it's becoming a very dangerous place. Um, if we can all awaken this gut intuition our thalamus then you know it could save your life yeah um i i had a similar situation not on 9 11 but uh a while back where i was supposed to go to this uh, and i'll make the story really quickly i was supposed to go to to a new year's party and we end up not going because my stomach just turned into knots and if it was if someone was putting something in my stomach and just twisting it and I told my wife okay we're not gonna go to the New Year's party and as soon as I said that it was gone so wow I knew I wasn't supposed to go the next day several people had gotten injured went to the hospital people got arrested so I'm not gonna say where it was but it's just sometimes you really get a, a harsh message and it's very easy to ignore and just say oh that's just me um, it, you're right. You're absolutely right. So the more that we can listen to our intuition and, you know, learn when to trust it and become more discerning, then, you know, as you say, it can save you an awful lot of, of grief, for want of a better word. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put myself out on a limb here. Um, I keep, and I know it's not me and I know it's not my wife, I keep selling, uh, smelling some kind of oil like a myrrh are you wearing any kind of oils no no it's like I'm a not. really strong as soon as you came on the smell just got really strong uh, all right it might be just me then well ramon actually uh right before uh right at the beginning of this interview i put on i i started burning a stick of what's called uh tibetan musk which is an incense so you may be picking that up it's wow. really strong up my nose. Wow. Uh, uh, but uh, it smells really good. <laughs> you're, you're. Um, I I would say for anybody who's trying to wake up on the way of waking up, um, it's definitely a, a must-read book because the way you draw things out, it's so easily understood. And I'm gonna keep repeating, beating the dead horse with this. <laughs> You're very but, sweet. You so, really are. Because um, it's really funny because years and years ago, I've never really, I haven't really earned any money in the last 15 years because I don't know if you guys have ever written a book, but, um, you know, you put an awful lot into it and you get very little back. And it's really funny. Um, a, a very spiritual girl said to me about a couple of years ago, she said, you know, Hazel, she said, when you start seeing life uh, from a different perspective, and she said, when you do this as like your charity work, um, life will flow much more easily for you. And it was amazing how that one sentence could like change my life. So it's like, I don't mind doing the work and calling it my charity work, but it's wonderful when people like you say that it actually helps you on your journey because that is the payment, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's well, it's fantastic. So thank you. Well, same same thing here. We had the uh, when we started this show, Ramon and I both said uh, doesn't matter uh, what the cost to us or what the uh, you know how many interviews we have to do or how many shows we have to do. Uh, our show will be a complete success if we help one person. Well, then that's great. And uh, and we we got that almost immediately the the response well well thank you what you guys have done is has really helped me type responses so 
So that put us right out right out of the gates as as considering that that we were already a success because what we're doing was was has already helped someone. So mm. I I I met this monk uh one one time we interviewed this monk and his name is Khan and me and my wife went to go meet him here in Tokyo and we were sitting um with him and his energy was so strong so as you're describing in there's a part of your book where you're describing in the elevator with uh I forgot his name the Oh yeah Swamiji Shiv um Oh, crikey. Swamiji Shiv Kripananji. Yeah, I can't pronounce um, that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. Oh, I've, I've just realized you just said Tokyo. How are things in Japan? Um, Things from where I live, about 45 minutes from Tokyo, and you couldn't tell. Um, people are really good at, at hiding their emotions and stuff. And we're not in the areas that were highly effective. But if you go to Tokyo Bay, you can tell because that's all landfill, and certain the the level has gone down uh, of the land, and the manholes are a little higher above. And there's like YouTube videos where houses are floating on water, and it's oh, all like you know man-made land. The whole entire Tokyo Bay is like that. But uh, um. The, um, the, as far as over here, I'm just using my intention to remove any radiation. Um, wow. But, yeah. So, well, our, but, thoughts, our thoughts are with you guys because that's been the most... I mean, you know, we moan like I might moan about my back or you might moan about working long hours or whatever. But imagine losing absolutely everything everything you have or that you hold dear in like five minutes and in fact it's really interesting because uh have you ever heard of a book called bringers of the dawn by barbara marchanayak i think that's how you say it yes. she wrote a, a wonderful book channeled from she said the pleiades the syrians um and it was written about 10 years ago but it's a bestseller you can still get it bringers of the dawn and in that book it said there will come a day when people will have to leave their homes and they will never be able to go back. And we're seeing this accelerating over and over and over again as this huge shift back towards coherence takes place. You know, it's it's not an easy process. Well, I want to read yeah. something. I want to read something out of your book uh, when you were speaking with uh, that astrologer, uh, Linda. Uh, what the heck? I can't find Linda her. Joyce. Yeah. Linda Joyce. Yeah, she's great. Uh, she said, uh, uh, from April 2011, when Neptune moves into Pisces, our yearning for spirituality will increase because faith will suddenly become more essential to our survival. This necessity could be brought about by natural disasters that bring us together or a mass spiritual sighting, discovery, or experience that heralds a new, vi new reality. Now, just that statement in itself in your book uh, is reflected immensely right now in the world i mean uh, it is but it's it's also you know it goes it harks back to this business of dear old bill tiller and i should just share with people who bill is he's one of the world's finest material physicists he spent 50 years studying consciousness and matter mainly um at stanford university and he now heads up the tiller foundation um, and I know a lot of these scientists have their detractors, you know, there's lots of people who agree and who don't, but Bill has shown definitively, um, and his, uh, his uh, ex experiments have been verified by many places around the world, that our physical thoughts, if they are sustained and focused, can create a physical outcome. And this, in the future, I think could become very, very, very important. <clears throat> Excuse me again, because I said to Bill, I said, does that mean that if everyone was thinking the same thought at the same time and they really meant it with their whole heart and mind, I said, does that mean that humanity could, in principle, turn back an asteroid or deflect an asteroid or a tsunami or anything else? And he said, absolutely we could. He said, that would become child's play once we're all enlightened right. i mean 
when you have people like that, because for instance, when I watched someone like Sai Baba manifest ash and manifest objects, which I did, I sat in a room with him with three other people, and I know he wasn't faking. I know not everyone agrees with Sai Baba. I'm not judging the man who's now, I believe, dying. But the point is, what they're doing is they're not manifesting something from nothing. What they are doing is organizing energy, which is what Bill talks about, so that physical events and objects can manifest in this reality. And this is because mind and intention form patterns which form matter. Now, scientists know that energy becomes matter, but they don't know how. They don't know the actual mechanics of it. And this is why they've got the big collider now in Europe. You know, is it in Switzerland, CERN? Um, and they're trying to find out how energy becomes matter. And so when you guys think about this, that all energy that ever was or will be in this universe was birthed at that moment of the Big Bang, it makes you realize that we are merely recycled energy and information because we were birthed from an explosion of light and light carries information. So when atoms eventually evolved, like hydrogen atoms and so on and so forth, they started forming about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The thing to really blow our minds is that we and everything in our universe is fundamentally made up of atoms. But atoms are known as a feedback system, which means that atoms have memory. So if you were to go to an ancient pyramid and put your hand on it and you happen to be a highly awake soul, you can retrieve the information in the atoms that are in the pyramid. It's the same thing that, you know, I remember Deepak Chopra said to me once, he said, we are all one. He said, you could have atoms inside you now that were once inside Jesus or Mohammed or whoever. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is so far out. <laughs> but he was absolutely right. So now just go back and think about this, guys. The atoms that make you up now have been here since the beginning of time. Atoms have memory. So who and what you are is all inside you. All knowledge is inside you and it's inside everybody. Right. With that being said, have you experienced during or after or even before your experience um, manifesting something out of nothing and then, you know, being in shock that you, you did it? She just oh, yeah, I, tr yeah, I tried to manifest a ring because I'd actually, you know, I'd heard uh, because I actually had this um, experience back in 98 and then I didn't meet Sai Baba till about, I can't remember, it must have been 2003, 2004. But because I had heard that such people could manifest objects, I actually tried doing it. And the shock uh, when I realized that for a very brief moment that I could, I had this potential, it freaked me out so much it stopped it happening. But when you read fantastic books like The Biology of Belief um, by Bruce Lipton, he's a cell was, biologist, yeah. you know, he's a brilliant guy. And when you read how the mind um, has an effect on the physical body. This is exactly what Bill is saying. It's what Bruce Lipton's saying, and it was certainly my experience. Mind comes first. Consciousness comes before everything. Mind and intention form patterns which form matter. And then we could carry the subject on to say, for instance, uh, consciousness has to, to come into this reality. It has to go through three stages. It has to go from information to energy, to matter. And a great analogy that uh, Professor Gary Schwartz gave me is, first we see the lightning, seconds later we hear the thunder, and then after that we feel the vibration. The light, which is information, reaches us before the physical effect. So this is why 
uh, so many people. I mean, uh, what's his name now? Rupert Sheldrake, the biologist, has done great work. The numbers of people who saw that Princess Diana was going to be killed, the number of people who saw the Twin Towers before it happened, uh, you know, the animals that ran away before the big uh, tsunami in Sri Lanka, they're feeling the information before the physical reality. And so this is what most people who have a psychic premonition are doing. They usually feel something uh, that is coming in the next 24 hours or so. Because as, um, as the unmanifest becomes manifest, um, it starts to crystallize into this reality. So it, the bigger the event, the bigger the shadow it casts forwards and backwards in time does that make sense absolutely yes we do so, we did it we did a uh the you're talking about consciousness create uh affecting uh re matter uh a few months ago i started uh masaya moto's rice experiment are you familiar with that no what he does uh in this is a an experiment anybody can do and i've talked about it several times on the show uh you take uh, three containers and put three equal amounts of rice and three equal amounts of water in those containers. And every day you say to one container, uh, thank you, I love you. You say to this other container, uh, you idiot, I hate you. And then you ignore the third container and you just watch the, the progress as, as the, de the, the decay process through those three containers. And it is absolutely amazing the results. The uh, yeah. the glass, the 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 container you t tell I love you to, uh, it stays fresh and white and pristine for a, a very very long time. The one you say I hate I hate you to, uh, it uh, starts decaying and getting uh, you know real peaked looking. And but the one that you completely ignore rots faster than 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 the one that you hate i mean it's it's dramatic the the amount of uh decay that happens in the the ignore one so that told me that any attention is better than no in attention at all uh, but you see this is fantastic what you're telling me because this validates in a sense everything that bill and many other scientists are saying what you think about the most in other words, you're giving energy to it. Thoughts are things, they're frequencies, and they uh, get become set in your energy field around your grid, on your grid, energy field, whatever you want to call it, and they bounce back and become your reality. And so if people keep giving energy uh, to things that they hate or loathe about themselves, as you said, that is what will come into being. But if you start concentrating on what you do want and you do it in a heartfelt, full emotion way, then that too will come into your being. But before you can get what you want, you have to let go of the energy of the, of the old stuff. Otherwise, it's just going to be stuck on your grid forever. When you stop paying attention to something, it just dissipates and dies. And that's exactly what you've just said. And so if you had, Bill explained it, and I thought this was a wonderful analogy. He said, imagine 200 people go in a church and they think with a coherent mind, with their hearts and minds, for an outcome, uh, for, say, Joe Bloggs to be healed or whatever it is. And when they do that, they're building what's known as a sacred space, a coherent space. And this awakens the underlying field of intelligence, the latent energy within that church. And then they all go home and the energy starts to fall away. But then they come back the next day and they pray again. And then they come back the next day and they pray again. And he said that starts to organize like a lattice grid in geometric patterns until it reaches a plateau. And then the person that they're praying for will become well. And that happens because the energy and the energy within the, the, the church and the thoughts are creating a totally coherent atmosphere. Yeah. 
It, it awakens the underlying intelligence that wants you and everything around you to be perfect. For instance, the um, the water crystals at Lourdes. I know that you guys must know about the work the work of Dr. Emoto, Masuro Emoto. Hey, he's the yeah. one who did the rice experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of him as you said it, obviously. Um, and the water crystals at Lourdes are pretty coherent. So when people enter that sacred space of Lords, when and if they can truly believe with their whole heart and mind that they are healed, that's when they are healed. This is um, brain coherence is one of the explanations for spontaneous remissions in illness because at that moment when you have total brain coherence, all karma from all times is wiped out. And um, so that pure coherence is instantaneously, um, what's the word, uh, transmitted to every cell in the body. And therefore, every cell in the body thinks, I'm perfect. And they become perfect. And in the end, way back in 1998, I be, it, came, it came to the point where I was almost afraid to think because everything that I thought was happening instantaneously. It was like a madhouse. And so in the end, I would run around the house going, everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. <laughs> because I was so worried that if I didn't think that, something else would appear or disappear. You know, it was quite freaky. And I think it's also really important to say that there are an awful lot of kids out there who are taking crack cocaine and heroin and smoking cannabis, which I never did. I was a health writer. Um, they are having spontaneous Kundalini awakenings. And in Countdown, you will have seen the picture of the girl who was on crack. She's only 15. And you can quite seely see in that picture that all of her yeah. chakras have blown wide open. And she I had think. had a walk, you know, she'd had a walk in and it's in a very immature consciousness. So these kids haven't the faintest idea what they're dealing with. I have a story for you, um, Hazel. I, when I lived in New York, there was a gentleman. He was very high on crack, older gentleman about in his 40s. Wow. And he was just like gibbering and jabbering and talking to himself and just like scratching and and I, something told me, say, I said, you see that tree over there? He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, you should go hug that tree. It'll ground you. Yeah. And he went over to the tree and he hugged the tree. And then he sobered up for a few minutes. And he just <clears throat> kept kissing the tree. And I was like, how are you feeling? He was like, oh, man, wow. And you could see the instant change. He was no longer like just that walk, whatever walking he had, because I could tell he, he there was an entity there. Right. Was gone. And as soon as he let go of the tree, he was right back. You know, his eyes became bloodshot again. And I said, "Hug the tree again." He'll hug the tree, and then That's... he just sober up. It was amazing. But it is uh, amazing because, strangely enough, when I was, I'll never forget as long as I live. Years ago, um, I went to. Uh, a big um, talk that Deepak Chopra was giving. And to start it off, he had this guy come out. There were about 4,000 of us. It was this massive theater in London. And um, he had someone come out with one of these crystal bowls. And we were all chanting the Om. And yet I could feel the resonance building. And I knew that I was going back into that heightened state again, which I was, by that time, I'd become a little bit nervous of. And... Um, <laughs> I was so freaked out because I knew that my feet were starting to lift off the ground that I ran outside and I laid on the ground outside this theatre in London in quite cold weather and held onto a tree because I had learnt that when things get really hairy, if you like, if you to ground yourself instantaneously, if you hang onto a tree, it happens, as you say, almost instantaneously. It really does. And you need to eat physical food, too, because remember, I wasn't eating any physical food for a while because I was living on divine light and divine light is information. So because I had learned to digest the information, you know, what is matter? Matter is information. Right. Um, and so I believe in the future that we will become light beings again. We will return to being non-physical beings. So I'm not inviting anyone 
to go on a hillside and stop eating food, that would be the craziest thing to do. You have to be a very highly evolved spiritual soul to be able to do things like that. But what I'm saying is, in science, they now know and recognize it's possible. They don't understand the, mechan the mechanics of it yet, but they're getting there. You know, it's all happening really fast. So to close, I would, you know, just remind everyone that not to be envious of masters of light and time, um, because they are the forerunners that are helping the rest of us enter this process. You know, they're here to teach us. And if you are with a truly enlightened master, you should only feel absolutely true, true and unconditional love. And it's really important to know that we're all part of God and all parts make the whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Crystal, uh, so where can everybody uh, get a hold of your material? And Oh, you're so sweet. Um, okay, um, all of my books are now available on Amazon.com in America. They should be at uh, bookshops like Barnes & Noble. Countdown to Coherence is also available on Kindle. And my website has the details of pretty much all my books. And I'm sorry if it's not hugely up to date on my radio shows, but I just... Um, I, I, I'm only one person, so I can only do so much. But it's www.hazelcourtney, which is C O U R T E N E Y dot com. Yeah, and you can just uh, click on her picture, and I'll take you right to her website as well. Hey. Right. Uh, you have been such a pleasure to have on the show, and I wish we can keep you for another five hours. <laughs> you're so sweet. It sounds to me like you guys should be doing your own talking because you're both very awake already. Well, we are we are working towards that ourselves. Uh, it's a process for us. Absolutely. It's a process for us all, you know, but uh, hey-ho. Anyway, how, is, how is your back? Um, it's, do you know, I'm thinking of having stem cells to, um, to try and regrow a couple of my discs because I fell very badly about five years ago. Um, and I have quite severe osteoporosis. I'm 62. And it turns out that for long before I became a health writer, I had um, a hysterectomy. This is, I know this is more information than either of you guys need. But for 20 years, I had no estrogen. And so without estrogen, a lady's got no bones. But of course, I didn't know then what I know now. So I have this passion to help others not end up with bones like the ones that I have. But what I also know is if I could return to that totally coherent state, which of course I would love and I do try to get a balance. I meditate, I chant, I eat good food, I do exercise. You know, we have to do it all. Um, but I know that if I were truly coherent, then I should have been able to heal my back. But of course, it only happened five years ago. But it's maintaining the coherence that's a difficult thing. And even masters of the self, we're still in a physical body. We might be divine beings, but we're still in a physical shell. So the physical shell, unless you look after it properly, can, does, and will start to fail. So, you know, I may have learned... What I've learned a little late for me, but I can help others not to go through the pain that I have to go through now. And I'm sure that one day I'll find an answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Well, thank you so much for, for being with you with us, Hazel. Uh, we uh, absolutely love you and you love your work. And uh, are, are you're coming to America. You're doing a tour here. No, I did. I did it. Um, I got back last Sunday. I got home a week today. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. So, listen, lots of love to, and great good luck for what you're doing. You're doing great stuff. Well, thank right. you very much. Thank All you, right, Hazel. Bless. All right. Bye. Bye. We want to thank everybody for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, let's see. Next week we have uh, – who is next week? Uh, Sonia. So Sonia Barrett next week uh, should be a yeah. very good interview. Uh, we're going to continue the line of women. Uh, should be Sonia Barrett, and then after Sonia Barrett, we have Lynn McTaggart. Um, Some good stuff and, coming up. And then after that, we'll have uh, Krista Clark with segment three. Yeah, so, so. all good stuff. Well, uh, keep listening, guys, and we will uh, talk to you later. 
Namaste. Have oh, oh condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. I had to get that in. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> good night.